I would now like to introduce our speaker, Duzanne Dupel. Uh, Duzanne was born in Johannesburg and studied architecture at the Witt School of Architecture and Planning. In fact, we are contemporaries. Uh, we started first year of architecture in 1993, uh, a turning point in South African history uh, with Kudesa negotiations and an interim constitution that paved the way for the first non-racial democratic elections. Uh, this constitutional transformation was not particularly reflected in the School of Architecture at the time, uh, but I think it's interesting uh, for us to sort of uh, come back after, after this period. Uh, so uh, fast forward 28 years later, uh, I thought it would be interesting for the school to connect with its alumni uh, who are shifting ways of thinking and making architecture. Uh, Duzanne and interior architect uh, Aline Strikers teamed up in 2007 to form Dupel Strikers. I'm sure I'm pronouncing it wrong. Uh, and they are based in Rotterdam. Uh, the ethos of the practice is based on the belief uh, that an interdisciplinary approach to design leads to sustainable spaces and an enhanced user experience. Uh, they are driven by the fascination for architecture with substance that, ge that generates work that transcends the, that transcends the spatial by creating social, ecological, and economic value. Giving form to the process and financing is just as important as the design itself. A firm belief that design can act as an agent for social renewal leads to strategies that contribute to both a circular and inclusive economy. Over the last 10 years, they have developed concepts and realized projects from installations to large-scale interiors, architecture, and urban interventions in which these principles are integrated. They are currently working on a disruptive solution for healthcare housing, a nature-based pavilion for a horticultural expo, and several museum conversions, new retail formulas, and a radical concept for building as a cluster of services. Uh, I'm keen to see that one. Over the last decade, their work has gained worldwide appreciation through numerous publications, exhibitions, and awards. Uh, I will now hand over to Duzanne. Thanks uh, very much, Nabil, and thanks uh, so much for the invitation to, to speak. Um, I think the last time I gave a talk in South Africa was about three years ago, but the last time at WITS or, uh, was, yeah, I think, 2005. So it's, it's quite a while since I've been able to talk. I would have loved to have uh, come in person, but we will have to do it with this uh, online uh, version. Um, I'm going to share my screen and, and get straight into it. So as Nabil said, as I was born in, in Johannesburg. I grew up in Melville, a nice little suburb of Johannesburg, and I went to Parktown Boys High, um, followed by military service, which I'm sure not that many of you have uh, uh, done as students. Uh, but uh, after my military service, I, I went into um, to bids. And uh, during our first or second year, I think it was with Peter Rich, we went into um, some of the rural areas, and that was where we first became exposed to some of the um, really extreme conditions and also the ingenuity of people in these areas in extreme poverty using what they can find to to create space and this this incredible adapt adaptivity of the people and the use and of materials and the smart use of um, circular economy was something that really stayed with me. Uh, nothing goes wasted, everything gets recycled, and in every object or element, there's a potential uh, value case. Um, maybe one of the most striking uh, meetings we had uh, was in Zimbabwe with an architect, Mick Pierce. Some of you may know him. I think he's moved from Zimbabwe to uh, Australia, but he explained at that time an incredible building he had uh, designed, uh, the Eastgate building, based on the principles of a termite hill. And this idea that nature can inspire the way in which we make space and uh, in an intelligent way use the passive potentials of the sun, wind, the, the earth, uh, green and water is something that really stuck with me. Um, so I moved to Holland in 1996 after my bachelor and uh, I moved to work for MVRDV Architects. Um, it was an amazing period. and. What struck me in that time was that in Holland at the time, a lot of most architects um, who were dealing with sustainable issues 
were I uh, were kind of characterized as a sustainable architect. It was like you could choose either you're a sustainable architect and then you fall in this camp sustainability or you're a regular architect. And this was something to me was very strange coming from South Africa where uh, sustainability is, is just a kind of given. It's, a, it's actually a, a necessity dealing with extreme climate, dealing with uh, resource uh, 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 scarcity, water issues, and trying to create added value in projects is, is, a, is a given. Um, so what I did when I started my company in 2007 with Elina Strijkers is, is we took this agenda um, that I started to learn when uh, as a student in South Africa when, and we extended it. So what do we basically do in the office is we uh, try to develop uh, strategies for a circular inclusive economy. Um, and this is based on uh, obviously uh, things like energy, comfort, materials and water. Um, and climate design is one of the main drivers behind the way in which we uh, we do our work. And in, do, in so doing, what we're actually looking for are uh, value cases. So how can we, through design, create added social or ecolo uh, ecological uh, value? And in some cases, maybe even economic value. And this we do on two scales. So we do it on the interior scale and, and on the architectural scale. Um, sometimes also on the larger scale, the urban scale, um, and we do it in the existing uh, fabric and uh, future fabric. And one of the main strategies that we've been exploring for the last decade is how can we um, go from a linear city, city metabolism to a, a circular uh, city metabolism. So we do a lot of res uh, research uh, and investigation into what are the flows through our cities, what are the flows through our, our buildings, and what kind of urban systems and processes can we tweak so that we can short circuit some of these flows to reduce um, resource outputs, so actually to reduce waste. And sometimes it's a small tweak on an ur urban scale, but most mostly in our, in our practice, it's uh, looking at the architectural scale and how can we, on a, in a smart way, close some of these loops to create more, sa more sustainable uh, architectural solutions, but also sometimes uh, generate an innovative uh, business case or value case. So we do this on different scales, on the scale of the interior and on architecture. And actually, this is our core competency, interior and architecture we see as equal disciplines. And every every now and then, we also get asked to, to do some work on the urban scale. And that's much more in, turn, in, in line with kind of urban strategy. And this means that we get asked to do a lot of transformation projects. And we really love transformation projects. Um, they, they're probably about 60% of what we do. For example, this old ambulance garage in uh, the inner city of Rotterdam, where the client asked us to, 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 to make a house for, for them. And through creating this dugout space with the floating um, uh, bedrooms uh, kind of bar above, we managed to create a very um, spacious uh, dwelling uh, in a very green, lush environment, two minutes from the central station uh, uh, of Rotterdam. In a similar way, uh, an old uh, town hall in the city of Valveik, they asked us to create a temporary museum uh, for, for shoe and textiles. Uh, and this we really had to do on a shoestring budget. So basically, we just painted, we dem demolished all the walls that didn't work, painted everything blue and created a very strong contrast between the existing and the new um, with a couple of um, special interior elements which uh, kind of created an, uh, a strong ambience to the space. But it wasn't really the, the project itself or the, 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 the outcome, the special outcome that was interesting in the project. It was the way in which we used uh, local um, uh, uh, residents in the area around and uh, students and also uh, unemployed people in the area to help on the project. So there was a, uh, especially the demolition side of the project, was a, uh, there was a lot of community participation. And that was very interesting because through the community participation and also through the sponsoring from the surrounding shops, when the museum went open, it was suddenly a place to be in a meeting place because of the process of making the space. Maybe one of the most interesting early projects we did about 10, 10 years ago uh, is the Haka Recycle Office. Uh, this is an incredible building uh, in the inner city harbour of Rotterdam, 
about five minutes, 10 minutes from the, the center of the city on the river. And it was an old uh, distribution center uh, built in 1914. Uh, and it stood derelict for many, many years, uh, for about a decennium. And then we were asked to come up with a concept for the ground floor to reactivate the building as a catalyst for this the district development, because this is a kind of derelict, rundown, uh, inner city harbor area. Um, so the idea was to do a thousand square meters of commercial program, but actually kind of convention center, meeting spaces, flexible workspaces, where young talent uh, could meet and uh, create a kind of a, a buzz, which would have a spin-off effect for the whole area. Um, and what we did was, we analyzed the building and we, we said what, what would be interesting for us is to do the whole interior with 1,000 square meters only using waste materials. So we, we hooked up with the municipality of Rotterdam and we um, found eight buildings in the city which will be demolished in that coming year. And we did an inventory of all of the materials that would be coming free from those demolition projects. And some of the materials, like old doors, are usable as one-to-one. -one. Uh, but a lot of the materials, like um, uh, roof slats, uh, need some kind of a, a, a handling to be able to be used as, a, as an interior element. So basically what we did was we earmarked materials from demolition projects and we, um, uh, based our design on these material flows, so it's a very different way of designing because instead of um, just designing what we like aesthetically, we basically had to design, come up with a functional plan and then adapt the designs according to the flow of waste uh, materials from these eight projects. And one of the interesting aspects of the project was we had a dual commission. The first commission was to design it and build it. And the second commission was to do a research into how sustainable is this approach? So we measured everything, every demolition uh, um, movement, uh, the use of drills, the, the, the kilometers that were driven, the use of electricity, everything was monitored. And at the end of the project, we could compare this interior to a traditional interior. And I'll show those results a little bit later. So it's a very interesting project because it led to a, a, an interior that we otherwise would not have come up with. So what you see on the right hand side is an entrance uh, desk based on the made from from roof slats and a little bit of a second hand greenhouse. Um, and on the right hand side here, a very uh, a funky meeting space uh, where everybody can enter through their own door. Very democratic, maybe uh, appropriate in certain uh, in certain situations. Uh, flexible working spaces, actually raised working spaces in relation to a kind of uh, restaurant space. Uh, this was before it was taken into use uh, and also on the right hand side, a pantry built from old greenhouse uh, elements. And maybe one of the most uh, interesting elements was this uh, flexible wall. Um, we needed some kind of acoustic elements in the space so that we could subdivide it for workshops and uh, we came up with this idea to use uh, old clothing uh, because just down the road was a kind of a place where you could um, uh, send uh, old clothes to and those old clothes would be shipped off to probably uh, mostly Africa. So we went to this, uh, to this, uh, this place and we said we want to rent uh, 8,000 kilograms of secondhand clothes and they kind of looked at us like you guys are absolutely crazy. Uh, what do you mean rent? Uh, clothes. Yeah, so well, it's temporary, you know, we're going to give it back in about four or five years. You can, uh, but this idea of renting the clothes didn't work out. We had to buy the clothes and then we sorted it on color and it went off to get washed. And uh, when they washed it, they mixed all the colors again. So it came back and it was t totally uh, mixed. And what we did was we basically built this whole uh, wall uh, using folded clothes. And this wall is um, um, organized as a kind of a rainbow. And maybe the most interesting thing of the project um, uh, was that we built it with uh, unskilled laborers. So we worked with uh, ex detainees ex-criminals in a reintegration program. And this was a very, very interesting uh, social aspect to the project uh, because it meant that we had to design it uh, in such a way that it could be built by unskilled labor. 
So what we did was we designed a lot of um, simple details, like a, an auditorium bench made up of a simple section, but then a section that needs to be uh, re, uh, copied uh, three and a half thousand times. And through this repetition, we created a certain kind of aesthetic, uh, which we would not have, uh, have had come up with had we had a different kind of um, uh, working aesthetic. The interesting thing about working with these guys was that we, um, there were, I think, eight guys uh, in the team uh, that uh, the idea was that a couple of them would get a permanent job so that they would get in situ training and that would lead to a job. Unfortunately, this part of the trajectory didn't work, so we didn't manage to, to get any permanent jobs to them. But the, the, work, the workers, the guys working on this were incredibly proud to be part of uh, the making of this interior. And when we look back at our research and the results, like what, what did we actually achieve? I mean, is this, uh, is this a feasible way of working and would we do it again? Basically what we did was we took all of our outputs from the research and we compared it to a traditional interior. Let's say we had built the same interior with the same functionality, the same program, and we had done it with new materials and with a professional workforce. Uh, how would that compare to what we've done? And what we basically uh, discovered was that in terms of carbon dioxide, uh, or, or let's say the CO2 footprint, yeah. uh, the labor costs, sorry? Sorry, uh, someone's mute button is not on, uh, sorry oh. about that. I'm just going to try. Okay, to... sorry, I thought someone is asking a question. Um, so basically compared to a traditional uh, uh, approach, the CO2 footprint, the labor costs and the material costs are roughly 70% lower than a traditional building, but the man hours were three and a half times as high. So it took us three and a half times the time to build it, but we had a 70% reduction in CO2 labor costs and material costs. So this, is a, this was for us a very interesting project because uh, it also formed the basis for, for projects uh, that followed. Uh, one of which uh, is in Amsterdam, the Circle uh, Pavilion. This is for ABN AMRO, and ABN AMRO is one of the largest banks in, uh, in the Netherlands. We did this together with another office, the Architectancy. So it was a, it was a combined project. We focused on, on the interior. Um, but basically, the, the idea of this project was to develop a, a pavilion to explore the potential of circular economy in the building industry. Um, so the pavilion itself um, is designed from the principles of circular economy. Um, the interior is designed from the same principles and the programming, the use of the space is, um, is, is all set and geared to generating uh, knowledge around the circular economy in the building sector and coming up with new programs and financial structures to support the transition to a circular economy in the building sector. Um, so it was a fascinating project for us because the whole structure is based on a, a bio-based uh, uh, building uh, system. All of the beams, everything, the, the whole construction is demountable uh, and all of the, the sizes of all of the elements are such that they can be, be reused at later levels. And what we really focused on in the interior, besides the use of circular materials like um, secondhand wood for the floors and um, old clothing for the, which what got pulverized and used as a spray for the acoustic elements, we, we also tried to focus on coming up with an interior that offers um, uh, flexibility in use because it's a, basically a neutral space and by by introducing movable vertical screens, uh, which also work as acoustic elements, the space is subdividable for workshops, uh, for different kinds of configurations from a uh, banquet hall into small intimate, uh, intimate dining. Um, for us, it was a very interesting project in the sense that um, uh, it took us to the next level in thinking about uh, circular economy and building as a service. Um, a lot of these building elements um, have been designated a second life already. So at the end of their life cycle, the contractors, the suppliers of these elements 
will be uh, bought back. And these, these prices for buying back the elements have already been settled in contracts. So already the second life of building elements as they come free from the structure have been, uh, have been worked out. Uh, so it's a very interesting circular approach to building based on the life cycle of elements and components. Um, staying in Amsterdam, uh, another interesting little project we did, uh, maybe a, a little bit more inspired also by climate design, is the Spring House. Um, it's a, a really nice little structure. It was, it used to be a little factory building, very, very close to the central station. On the right hand side, you see these curved uh, roofs. That's the, the central station on the I River in Amsterdam. So it's really a small factory, old factory office building um, on a stone's throw away from, from the central station. And the client wanted us to come up with a, a, a kind of an up topping. We, we, we could add uh, one or two layers to the, to the top of this building um, to create a, a kind of a, a co-creation space. So basically it's a working dining environment. The ground floor is restaurant with the working environment, workshop environment, and also a small hotel function, just a couple of Airbnb rooms. But uh, the, 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 the ambition was to make a huge gesture with a small budget uh, so that the building would also be visible from, from, from the central station and be an eye catcher on the eye as the boats uh, float by. And what we did was we analyzed the, the orientation um, of the building and the potential for a lightweight up topping on top of the structure. And we came up with the, the idea of putting a greenhouse on the roof, uh, breaking out the floors and the floors in the top layer and introducing a solar chimney into the greenhouse structure so that we could actually heat, heat up the, the chimney and create a natural passive cooling system for the structure in the summer months. Um, apart from that, obviously harvesting rainwater uh, and recycling as much uh, material, secondary use of material as possible were basic uh, givens for the project. The ground floor is a restaurant <clears throat> and then that kind of flows over with the large staircase into a kind of first floor with uh, uh, lounge spaces. And the idea here is it's quite a nice uh, office concept is people are um, have a membership to this uh, to this space. So if you if you're a full member, you can use everything, but there are different graduations. And if you're a part member, that means that you can use the the, the, the lounge and flexible layer for a couple of hours per day. And um, so it, it, it makes it possible for people with the different incomes, small companies to have a place where they can meet clients. And, and work and, uh, and, and network uh, in, a, in, a, in a nice uh, environment close to the central station. Um, so basically we, we, we kept the existing structure intact and added this kind of climate uh, machine on the roof using the double height of the space as a kind of a, a suction for um, pulling through air through the, through the structure. And obviously at night, this whole glass box on the roof lights up, so it becomes a beacon and is obviously has a, a small landmark function. Um, so here we're on the ground floor and in, in the restaurant uh, zone and moving up to the lounge level uh, where the older new layers are, are kind of uh, visible, wherever we could salvage the, the beautiful old structure uh, we did. Um, and mix that with uh, a number of new elements, uh, moving up to the roof space and uh, a, ter a terrace with a view over the water and towards the, the central station. Um, staying in the region, um, I included this project because it's it's almost completed. It's still it's still it's still being completed. But this is a project that was really inspired by that termite uh, uh, hill that I mentioned in the beginning with Mick Pierce and this visit to Zimbabwe as, as a student. Um, we were asked some years ago to design a, a, a pavilion, a, a, an innovative and sustainable pavilion for the Floriada in uh, Expo. It's a world expo in Almira. Uh, the urban plan is designed by MPRDV and basically they, they made a huge arboretum which, uh, of uh, from A to Z, so all of the plants uh, are organized uh, from A to Z, 
and uh, on one of the plots on the water side, we uh, we were asked to design a building for the province of uh, Flevoland. And basically, um, Flevoland is a province which is uh, uh, between four, uh, between three and, and and four and a half, five meters under sea level. And they asked us to come up with a concept that should also address a lot of um, societal uh, issues like climate change and resource depletion but also the topic of the Floriada, which is uh, feeding feeding the city and food innovation. So what we did was we basically um, visualized it or conceived it as um, a chunk of earth that uh, gets lifted up to the sea level uh, layer. So we lift up a piece of earth to, to the sea level layer and underneath that we have a restaurant and that lifted up bio-based world is a space for meeting uh, and for exchanging ideas business to business during the Floriada. And after the Floriada, it will become a, a space um, for students, uh, which will be part of a green campus. And what we really tried to do in the pavilion was to take the topic of circular economy and bio-based building, uh, but also this notion of climate architecture and demonstrate it in a didactic manner. So. The structure um, is uh, is made from 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 wood. It's a bio-based structure. Uh, we all know the benefits of wood and natural bio-based uh, insulation and materials. Uh, it's a CLT construction for uh, health. So it's a damp, open, uh, vapor, open structure. And on the roof, we have a, a glass uh, part of a glass roof, so we can capture capture heat when we want it. We can let it go when we want to create this kind of natural cooling. Uh, so the top the top level is a bio-based world and what happens underneath that is a kind of world where we try to introduce as many circular concepts as possible. So when people come to the building, there's this kind of the building is an exhibition in itself. It explains these notions as one moves through it. And uh, as we lift this piece of earth up to the sea, sea level, um, the, the ceiling line is the sea level line. So people become aware that they're actually also under sea level when they're walking through the structure. And uh, at the moment we're building it, so the green layer still needs to be uh, uh, added, but um, the whole earth layer is um, is is loam and lime, lime and loam, so it's a lime loam uh, combination. Um, and that goes through to this uh, ceiling. So the whole underside is a, is a, is a, is a loam uh, ceiling, maybe one of the largest loam structures in the Netherlands. Uh, a, a facade like this hasn't been made in the Netherlands yet. And the ground floor is the restaurant, the very open airy uh, uh, layer, uh, and uses many circular... Oh, someone's microphone is on. Always comes across. Thank you. Um, so the ground floor is also based on as many circular economy principles as possible. So lease, lease furniture. And then there's a huge tribune uh, podium that takes one up to the top floor. And one of the nice things about building with this uh, CLT uh, timber, massive timber construction is that the construction is the finish. So there's no additional finishes to the space. Um, what you see is what you get. And obviously we had to add uh, some some sheepskins and these kinds of things for acoustic uh, purposes uh, and integrate green also for part of the uh, healthy building uh, principles. Um, but it's a building that's been uh, just just been taken into use and um, the clients at this point are, are quite excited and quite happy about the the results and uh, we want to monitor also how it uh, how it develops in the coming years through a year, see what the seasonal changes do to the climate and what is the impact of this bio-based uh, construction and insulation to the, the inner in, indoor climate. Um, another project that uh, has not yet been built, and I hope, sincerely hope it will be built, it's all dependent on uh, financing from a client. Um, it's not in, in Holland, it's in, in, in Mexico, and it's an amazing, uh, actually amazing uh, client. They, uh, it's a guy who, um, has emigrated out of Mexico and um, he's living in Holland, but basically what he wants to do is he wants to give something back to his own country and he's an expert in tequila. So he's developed an organic tequila uh, recipe, which is a, a high premium 
brand tequila, triple A rating. And you can you shouldn't actually think of it as a tequila. It's a little bit more like a, a good cognac. Um, it's that kind of uh, quality. And basically what he, he, he wants to do is he's already producing it. Uh, he wants to create a facility where the local uh, workers can, can work, produce the organic tequila and where there are also a number of ancillary functions. So it's a combination of a tequila factory, but also a community center. So there's a church, um, there's a, 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 there are nine nuns that will uh, live in the building. There's a, a, a library and a museum. Um, and this is uh, part of his, his philosophy of how can we actually give uh, te tequila back to the people because the tequila industry has been industrialized since the 70s and uh, it's kind of run by cartels and uh, this small uh, entrepreneur uh, is trying to uh, give tequila back to the people uh, by joining the, 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 the religion at, and the church to the production process. But what we did with this project, which was maybe more interesting than the design itself, was we analyzed the production process of tequila. So what you're seeing here is, a, is a, an, an infographic which basically shows how tequila is made. So the purple loop is the 300 agave. Agave is the, the large cactus that you saw in the, in the rendering. Um, these are the, the tequila plants is made from the agave. 300 uh, agave plants and heads go into the process and at the end of the, the process uh, every day come 1300 uh, bottles of tequila. But what we did was we analyzed all of the waste streams because um, if you think of it as a linear process, then it's a linear process with a lot of waste. But if you start analyzing the waste streams and start identifying new business cases for the waste streams, it becomes a much more interesting and vertically integrated uh, concept. So um, what, what we discovered uh, is that uh, you can also make animal fodder from uh, some of the waste uh, streams. You can obviously make compost, which is a kind of no brainer, but you can also make honey, um, fibers. You can make fibers uh, to make textiles. Uh, so he's connecting it to top designers to start designing an agave textile uh, uh, chain. Uh, you can also make high power energy bars. And maybe the most surprising is you can also make uh, agave perfume. I haven't smelt it, but apparently it's delicious. Um, so this is a very interesting approach to us because at the moment that you start to identify these waste streams as the beginnings of new production cycles, um, you expand the local economy and you expand the impact that this project will have on its local, uh, on its local economy. Um, as far as the design goes, we always uh, look at traditional building. So we took the traditional hacienda typology as a point of departure. And actually what we did was we connected two haciendas to each other. The top one is the, the production facility and the bottom one is the, um, the church, the library, the, the museum, the office spaces and the housing for the, the nuns and kitchen, etc. And what we did was we analyzed the use of the, the, the uses of the spaces, the indoor spaces, the outdoor spaces and um, the minimum daylight uh, requirements for each of the processes. And then we combined these parametrically with um, uh, access and views and uh, specific daylight needs per program. And uh, we morphed these openings according to the, these parameters. Uh, also based on the movement of the sun. So in the Hacienda, in the inside space, we have courtyards and around the courtyards, we have a walkway and the openings of these uh, walls of the, of the courtyard are based on the movement on the sun. Um, basically, it's an inverted shading diagram. So how to create shade at the points where you want it based on the movement of the sun, uh, connected obviously to a parametric uh, model. And the idea of the structure itself is using the local uh, building technology. So it's it's quite a contemporary, modern looking building, but based on local building traditions using stones and uh, local uh, timber and local building traditions and obviously local labor. Um, here, the walkway space 
looking at how can you create a shade and actually a, a comfortable interior climate uh, based on keeping the sun out and creating movement and views to the surrounding. Um, we don't know if this project will continue, but uh, I sincerely hope we get the opportunity to, 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 to put this one down. It's one of uh, my, my favorite projects. And that leads me uh, to the, the final and maybe most complex project that I uh, want to share with you. Um, it's a project called the Dutch Windwheel, and it started some years ago um, in a bar in Rotterdam. And um, some of you may know Kinderdijk. Kinderdijk is uh, a famous uh, area in Holland where you have these seven windmills. And if you think of Vermeer and the famous Dutch uh, paintings, landscape paintings, where you see these beautiful skies, and the, the windmills, this is this is Kinderdijk. It's a, it's a, it's a UNESCO heritage uh, site. And I was sitting with the, the uh, director of um, Kinderdijk, and we were talking about uh, tourism, and we were talking about Rotterdam, and how Rotterdam in the last 10 years has transformed from um, a harbor city into one of the top 10, according to uh, the New York Times, top 10 uh, cities to visit. And why do people visit Rotterdam? It's basically because of the architecture. So there's a lot of innovative uh, modern architecture in, in Rotterdam. And uh, in the last 10 years, there are a number of structures uh, that have come, come up that have really made it a, a touristic destination. At the same time, uh, five years ago, uh, Jeremy Rifkin, the famous uh, economist from Chicago, got the commission to develop a strategy for um, changing the economy of Rotterdam. So to develop, to, to develop actually the next economy for Rotterdam. And basically what he did was he worked with 600 companies and said, how can we go from a, a linear fossil economy to a circular renewable economy? And what came out of this were uh, three pillars. So the first was the energy transition how to go to, from fossil to, to, fossil to uh, renewable energy. The second is the circular economy, how to get to a circular economy. And the third is digitalization. So the role that big data and the IoT uh, and digital, uh, Internet of Things and digitalization will play in this process. And basically, he said these three things, the energy transition, the circular economy and uh, digitalization, are going to become the new pillars for the next economy of the region and the city. Um, and basically, we need to connect this to education. So we need to ensure that the students of the future are able to work in these um, in these fields. And I was talking to the this guy, the director of Kinderdijk, and uh, we were talking about all of these aspects. And he said, you know, uh, DUS, it's short for Duzan, um, you know what Rotterdam needs? It needs a kind of tourist attraction, something like the London Eye, but then better, uh, combined with the windmill of the future. And uh, yeah, the more we drank, obviously, the, the better this sounded, and we started brainstorming. And uh, at the end of the evening, we were both convinced that this is an amazing idea and that we had to do it. Um, so when I got back to the office, I started I started thinking about it. Um, if you think about the London Eye, basically it's not a very intelligent structure. Obviously, there's a lot of structural ingenuity that went into it, but you spend 250, 300 million euros. So basically, if you look at a structure like the London Eye, it's an incredibly expensive structure, two or 300 million uh, euros, to make a number of cabins move around a big hole. And we started thinking, well, what if you could use this hole to generate renewable energy? with the windmill of the future uh, and maybe also with solar energy. And if you were to do this, then um, surely you could generate enough energy to add programs. So why could you not maybe work in this structure and live in the structure and recreate in the structure? And that's how we came up with this idea uh, for the Dutch wind wheel. And the first image that we made uh, but it was this one and basically we put it on the most prominent location in, in Rotterdam. So when the municipality saw it, they freaked and called us, which was a very good strategy actually. Um, and the, the basic idea is that it consists of two rings. So the outer ring is, uh, is, is uh, a cabin, but uh, is the attraction. 
but not cabins in the traditional sense. It's more like platforms that move like a paternoster lift uh, in a closed uh, surface. And the inner ring is a program ring with offices and housing, etc. And in the in the eye in the center, uh, we uh, envisaged a new uh, wind technology, the Avicon technology, which is basically uses ionized uh, mist particles to generate um, energy as the wind blows them through an, a, a, a field, an electrical field. So this was the first kind of concept that we developed and. We put it on the, the internet and it, it went uh, completely uh, viral. The Netherlands is known for its windmills. Around 1,200 of them, some dating back centuries ago, are continuing to stand across the country. Now the port city of Rotterdam is trying something new. It plans to introduce a high-tech windmill-shaped skyscraper. Find out more. A unique landmark. La patria dei mulini a vento potrebbe presto ospitare wind wheel. In Lanta di Mulini di Canto Fondat, as wind wheel di Bound Van. Pour leur wheel in avant, il y a l'avenir. Ils le seront peut-être pour leur roue a fond. Wind wheel. An unprecedented attraction. La struttura da 174 metri è progettata per essere circondata da due metri. Ein Gebäude, das die Winde in der niederländischen Hafenstadt Rotterdam dazu nutzt, sich selbst ohne externen Input mit Energie zu versorgen. So this was, this kind of went uh, went around the world, and uh, we were amazed at the responses. It was published in over a thousand uh, publications in a hundred countries within a six month period. And a funny thing started happening. Uh, we started getting phone calls from cities all around the world, like, "Can we order one of these uh, from companies, high tech companies? Like, we've got this product. Can we can we plug it in the wind wheel?" But also from research institutes, you know, we, we have a research line. Can we be part of this? Can we be part of this, uh, this adventure? So what we did was we um, decided to build a consortium and to develop the concept ourselves. So we built a consortium of 16 companies and we closed the deal with the Ministry of Economic Affairs in the Netherlands. We got funding and we started uh, an innovation program to develop this concept from what it was, uh, the first idea that was generated in the bar, to something that we could actually build. Um, and the first thing we did was we started looking at the innovations out there. Um, the wind technology, what we discovered was it's not possible to upscale that and actually implement it with, within 10 years. So we had to start looking for another wind alternative. Um, we also had to start looking at lifts, uh, which could move in a, in a, in a, in a curved surface, um, we had to start working out whether or not we could really make this attraction work in the way we want because the traditional uh, wheel is based on a wheel that turns and here we have a building with you know, the potential for cabins to move on a rail system on the outside of the building. Actually the building is the structure for, for the tourist attraction. So there were a lot of, a lot of um, uh, innovations that we started to explore with the companies, with the research institutes and it became an, an innovation driven design process. So the building started to transform from its original form into a, a single uh, form uh, with a wheel on the outside uh, and more mass and more body on the inside, uh, looking for a much stronger balance between wind and um, uh, solar, uh, solar energy. And then we started to analyze it from the point of circular economy and how can we make it more modular uh, also knowing that we uh, have a lot of interest from countries all over the world and developers all over the world who would be interested in having some adapted form for their local uh, local markets. So we, we looked at the idea of turning the two sides into a kind of into towers um, so that there could be this element of extending the structure. Uh, and then in the middle, we have this new winter generation, which I will explain in a moment. So. 
this modular concept, the idea of making uh, it expandable in height, uh, but also modular in the sense that everything's on a modular grid based on international standards, uh, lowers the costs, makes it more flexible, more adaptable, but also more future proof. Um, and as we started to talk more and more to uh, the companies involved and started to explore these principles of circular economy, um, the idea of building a, the building as a cluster of services started to become much more apparent and we started to uh, make uh, initial concepts uh, and business cases for building as a service uh, elements for the building. In an age of unprecedented innovation, as we move towards a circular and performance economy, we need to radically rethink the way we make buildings. We need to start thinking of buildings as a collection of services. This model is called building as a service. By separating the different layers of the building and breaking them down into components, each individual layer can be viewed as a collection of services. This modular building system combined with a flexible structure allows for function-free programming. This means that spaces are fully adaptable over time. An apartment can be converted into a hotel or office or even a school. In this type of building, providers remain owner of their innovation and are therefore tasked to keep them up to date or replace them when needed. The innovations are integrated as modules into the different layers of the building. The structure is constructed with modular bio-based elements made to maximum transportable sizes and assembled on site. The flexible floor concept makes it possible to integrate living plants and to adapt the installations and even change the position of the bathroom or kitchen to suit future needs. The facade or smart skin integrates state-of-the-art facade technologies to regulate privacy, air, temperature and light while simultaneously producing sustainable solar energy. It is composed out of internationally recognized standard modules, allowing for upgrades as technologies become more efficient. The interior is built out of modular elements on a 30 by 30 centimeter grid and assembled with dry connections. This enables disassembly and reuse of elements when the spaces change in function. The installations which regulate comfort are connected to the users through smart sensors enabling spaces to adapt real-time to user needs without the use of commands. This predictive environment is managed by a system of systems, a central brain that enables the individual systems to communicate optimally. The building is a learning ecosystem that process information collected daily in order to optimize the user experience and the environmental performance of the structure. By closing a performance contract with the building providers, end users are guaranteed an evolving environment in which both the software and hardware are perpetually being upgraded. Because of this, the total cost of ownership can be drastically reduced. This also forces providers to design long-lasting solutions that can easily be replaced and get a second life. Unlike traditional buildings, this system continually evolves to meet the changing needs of its users, setting the new standard for innovative building. So based on uh, so based on this uh, development of this concept, we actually built uh, one of these pods. So what you saw in the animation was uh, one kind of module, a pod, and we built it <laughs> on a really nice location in the in the zoo in Rotterdam, uh, between the polar bears and the bisons um, facing the sun. And basically what this, uh, I don't know if any of you can read Dutch, but it says, in the toekomst wonen we in an abonnement. In the future, we live in a service contract. So basically we did this with 33 partners um, uh, who all remain owner of their individual uh, innovations. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a combination of um, smart technologies. Maybe one of the most interesting aspects is the facade, which is an energy producing facade. We even have transparent solar panels which produce energy and the facade itself is composed of nine different uh, innovations all connected that all talk to each other and based on data uh, uh, production uh, can optimize uh, the use of, um, uh, of energy and production 
uh, of, of energy. So this is a small piece of the Dutch wind wheel, but building a small piece helps us to understand how the components work, how the technology can work, and um, how we can uh, upscale it to uh, the next uh, uh, level to the Dutch wind wheel uh, as a full, full blown building. Um, in the wind wheel, there are a, a number of aspects that we are addressing. We have a very high ambition in terms of circular economy and, and energy. The, the goal is to make a CO2 neutral structure and eventually we would like to move to a carbon neutral structure, so um, uh, moving really towards zero. Um, and of course, this is not that difficult on a small scale if you're building a single stand, a, a freestanding house with a small surface area and a large roof. Uh, if you build it in the right way, using the right materials, it's, uh, it's already easy to, to achieve those ambitions on site. But we're talking about a mega structure here. We're talking about a building of 50,000 square meters. So what we do is we, um, we've, uh, we've designed the building to, to harvest as much solar and wind energy as possible. So basically, the two legs of the building are towers of 30 by 30 meters, which are turned at a 45 degree angle to each other and joined at the top and the bottom. And this creates this kind of Venturi uh, effect looks a little bit like a Dyson uh, in a way. Um, and this Venturi effect ensures that if the building is placed in the predominant wind direction, which happens to be southwest in, in, in the Netherlands, um, then uh, we can harvest an optimal amount of, 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 solar, uh, of, of solar and wind energy. So what happens is we have these bars, they're called power bars in this opening spanning between the, the two arm, the two legs of the building. And in these power bars, we've got a Dutch innovation called the Power Nest, which are vertical access windmills um, uh, with uh, solar paneled roofs. Um, so each of these power bars has seven vertical access windmills. And the advantages of these integrated windmills is that they can capture wind at incredibly high speeds. They have no uh, vibration uh, issues and they don't kill birds which is obviously one of the, uh, something to take into account when integrating wind energy into a structure. Besides the, uh, the uh, solar surfaces, we have a, a smart skin. So we have a double skin construction where we can create a, a climate zone to passively uh, heat and cool spaces depending on the, the temperature and the, the, the type of uh, climate uh, and the year. Uh, so if it's summer or winter, and obviously we have a circular water concept, so capturing rainwater, reusing it and connecting it to a, a biogas production uh, facility uh, through collecting organic waste as well from, from, from the restaurant. Besides the, this, we also have a strong uh, strategy for the circular economy. So basically the building is broken up into seven layers, uh, the site, the structure, the skin, the services, the space plan and the stuff. Um, and these layers all have their own life cycle. So the site and the construction will be there for hundreds of years. Well, the site forever, but the construction, if you think about the Eiffel Tower, it can be there for hundreds, even uh, thousands of years. Uh, but the the facade has a shorter life lifespan and the installation has a shorter lifespan, et cetera, et cetera. So based on all of these, aspects, there's a strategy for how you design and how you connect elements to each other and what kind of service contracts and performance contracts do you make with the providers of all of these layers to the building. Um, and digitalization, so obviously we have performance contracts for the building, how does the building perform in terms of energy, water, uh, water use, etc. But we also have uh, the potential for narrow casting so the different layers, the different uses of the building, the workers, people living there, but also the tourists um, have their own uh, experience, which can be tailor made. I'll get back to that in a sec. Um, the program of the building is flexible. So it's a structure. This one for the Netherlands is 100 meters high. Um, it's a mixed use uh, construction uh, program. So the ground floors are basically more commercial uh, spaces. There's always a uh, 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 an introduction of a an innovation lab uh, or cultural program, depending on the on the location. So it could be in the case of uh, of Rotterdam, it could be uh, bio biotech, 
uh, an energy transition that would be incorporated in the in the ground floor areas and this would be a space where uh, the public can come uh, it's an educational cultural uh, uh, facility but also connected to innovative businesses in that field um, so how to create a kind of a hub in the building uh, above that there's a two two story hotel with its own uh, vertical access one of the legs is apartments the other is is, is office spaces and in the in the upper levels uh, we have the uh, panoramic uh, restaurant and uh, 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 tourist attraction um, so here uh, the biotech uh, center ground floor where businesses can uh, meet uh, meet each other work together innovate with uh, research institutes but where the general public can also come and uh, and, and experience uh, uh, the new the new technology and concepts um, and one of the interesting things about the the structure is we really grappled with the idea of vertical living um, so we said we want the apartments at 100 meters height to have um, at any case uh, their own green environment and an in-between climate so we created this double skin uh, facade concept where we can create a, a passive climate zone so here we have a moderate climate so in the winter when the sun shines this is a fantastic space to capture heat and we can lower our energy demand for the apartment itself but also through the flexible floors which were explained in the video making it possible to move installations making it possible to move bathrooms and kitchens um, we also have enough mass to integrate uh, earth substrate so we can actually have plants growing out of the floor uh, at 100 meters height and this in-between space between the two facades becomes a kind of terrarium like space connected to the rainwater capturing systems higher up in the building uh, gravity fed uh, systems um, Moving to the final aspects of the building, the, the tourist uh, object is an interesting one. I mentioned the London Eye, which costs about, I think it costs between two and three hundred million uh, euros. I know there was a plan for one in, in London, uh, I mean in New York, which was I think in the area of five hundred million. So you're talking about a lot of money for a tourist attraction of this, of this nature. And basically here, because we're using the structure of the building, we can make an attraction of this nature on rails for about 15% of the cost. Um, so there's a very interesting business case connected to this. Basically what you see here is on the bottom right, um, there's a, a cabin. So you enter a cabin, you go underground into a, a tunnel-like space where there's a virtual reality um, experience explaining um, uh, the local condition. For example, in Holland, the, the theme would be water, I mean, we live under sea level, so the water uh, and water management is a big theme. So that would be a virtual experience. And then one pops up on the other side and you go up uh, the one side of the building where you would have a view of the, the harbor. You can get out in the top of the building and have a bike to eat. And then you can get back in, have a view of the city and, uh, and go down and then obviously exit through a, 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 a shop. But one of the interesting aspects about the digitalization and narrow casting is that we're exploring with some of our partners the possibility of um, tailor making your experience. So this is a view of uh, being in one of the cabins in one of the pods. But basically, let's imagine you uh, book a trip from South Africa to Holland and you think, well, I want to go to the Dutch Windwheel and you buy your ticket for the Dutch Windwheel. But while you're buying your ticket, you get prompted to answer a number of questions like uh, besides who you're traveling with, uh, maybe some kind of information like what is your favorite music and what's your favorite uh, drink? Just some basic information. Basically, you forget about that. Uh, three months later, you arrive to Holland. When you arrive to Schiphol Airport, the build your, your mobile phone enters the airport and the building registers that. So you get a text message or WhatsApp message from the Dutch windmill telling you that your train to Rotterdam is on platform seven and it's leaving in 10 minutes. You catch your train. When you get to the, the train station in Rotterdam, you get another message. Your Uber has been ordered. It's uh, behind the central station. It'll bring you to the windmill. When you enter the windmill, you enter the, the this pod uh, basically, the pod knows that you're there again because of your telephone. Um, and as you move up, suddenly you, you hear uh, your favorite music 
it starts playing and it feels like serendipity. We actually call it orchestrated serendipity, but obviously it's it's not serendipity because three months ago you filled in what you what your favorite music was. And what you see in this glass wall is information. So if you're standing at one meter distance to this glass wall, the sensors in the pod can register your height, your eye level, and on the glass they can uh, project information about what you're seeing in the future in the distance. Uh, maybe it's a church, so you get in your own language some information about the church, what you're seeing in the distance. Uh, but you also get a little prompt on the screen saying your friends are already in the Panorama restaurant and they've ordered uh, your favorite beer. They're sitting at table 74. So this is a very interesting aspect about digitalization and the potential for narrow casting in architecture because it's already part of the way in which we design. We've already done a, a concept store for the, the top mobile telephone provider in Holland where we've implemented some of this technology. So it's really radically shaping the way in which we think about uh, how we design buildings and uh, it will have more and more effect on the way in which we design buildings in the future. And then obviously you arrive to the top to the Panorama uh, restaurant where you can have a drink and a look out over the city uh, before you uh, do your descent. So the interesting thing about this project is that we're architects, but we've actually become developers. So we've developed a concept and we've actually turned it into a formula. It's based on 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 energy, water and food, uh, circular economy and digital digitalization. Uh, and obviously with a strong link to innovation and this tourism uh, business business case. And what we've done now is we've built um, an, an intellectual property um, BV. So we've built another business around this intellectual property and uh, we're developing the project now in three countries. And basically uh, we're starting in the Netherlands. Uh, we have a project in America we're currently talking to a, a company in Asia who's interested and our ambition is to build one on, on every continent so we don't want to saturate the planet. But the interesting thing is to adapt it to, it, to its local climate and also to the local culture. So it's, it's, it's a formula but it's an adaptable formula uh, which we are very interested in exploring and our business case as an architect is radically different to to what we're used to because we've actually developed the concept on our own costs uh, with a couple of partners and when we build it in uh, in, in in the USA for example or in any of these countries uh, we will be paid a licensing fee so we we get a part of the development fee and we become a supervisor for for the structure so in in America currently there's a project that we we in, we're into the feasibility phase there's already a site uh, uh, determined it's the 2.0 it's the second version the round version of, of the building uh, we're currently busy in Oman where the building's taking on a slightly different form based on the local climate and the integrating um, green into the terraces of the of, of the structure um, uh, and also obviously dynamic shading is an inc incredible issue in, in, in Oman and in the Netherlands uh, we're also busy working on uh, finding uh, the right location for the project. So for me, this is a, an amazing project, an amazing adventure. I could never have imagined that uh, five years ago in the bar that it would uh, would have led to three potential projects in the world and uh, growing interest from around the world. And I think if we can manage to build one in America, then uh, it's going to open the, the floodgates for, for other countries uh, around the world. Um, and I think for me, this is a very interesting uh, development in our career as architects because we've moved from the passive role of architects uh, getting commissions to a much more active role of generating ideas that could make a big impact and marketing these in a way that makes it feasible to, to realize them as well. I'd like to leave it at that, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. and. Uh, yeah, if there's uh, if there's time in the bill, maybe there maybe there are uh, some questions. Maybe maybe we can have a little bit of a discussion. Yeah, uh, a while. Thank you, Dizan. Uh, and just to everyone here, if you don't mind sticking with us for another ten minutes while we we do some questions. I think there was so much presented, it would be good to to interrogate a little. Um, um, 
and uh, let me just see if there are any hands up, but I, I am seeing some questions. I'm, I'm just saying thank you. I, what, what I loved about your presentation or, or your work or method of working is the level of added complexity that you bring to architecture in many ways. It's like adding a whole new dimension uh, in the way you work, but the measure, this extreme measure of measuring everything, you know, measuring the waste, uh, uh, measuring the projects then afterwards to see whether it actually works because there's so much uh, greenwashing happening uh, and uh, it would be uh, and even those measures <laughs> are, are not necessarily uh, things we can trust because there's so much money involved in the green economy so so, so, so the whole thing becomes so skewed in some ways and and, and so I, I guess maybe my, my first kind of question is how do we um, how do we trust what or, or, or how do we as architects uh, find ways to measure our impact uh, in in what we build? Uh, one of the students was asking about existing buildings, but uh, because you were talking about reuse, adaptive reuse. But in South Africa, we, with such a growing economy, existing buildings can't do what we need. We need to go dense and much bigger and much more intense. And, uh, and and then the kind of building environment we see tends to be banks and insurance companies building big offices with great star ratings, but everything is about passive, uh, uh, about performance glass and very little about passive thinking. Uh, and then they have these great ratings, but they're fully air conditioned, but just with, you know, glass and, and, and st uh, stuff in between. Uh, What's your thoughts just in terms of, of, of the kind of realm we work in? Uh, it's a, that's a number of questions in one. You know, so I'm going to try to peel it, uh, peel it down. Um, I think the first question was, uh, was maybe about greenwashing and how do we trust? Uh, I think what we've seen happening more and more is that uh, sustainability has become a very kind of meaningless term. Uh, everybody is claiming to be sustainable. Um, circularity, circular economy is actually the same now in Holland. It's becoming a, a kind of meaningless term and a lot of companies are using it just to sell their products. But if you really start to look at what they're doing and what they're selling, it's, it's actually, it doesn't correlate. Uh, that being said, um, there are a number of companies who are really doing great things and developing new products and are really, are really making, uh, making an impact. And I think our role as, as designers is to just have a critical approach. Um, and to, I think the most important thing for, for me as a designer is to have a personal um, ambition, a personal, an opinion about what is it that I want to achieve as a, as a designer. And, and I was so um, uh, awe inspired by some of my predecessors in South Africa, uh, people like Peter Rich and uh, Heinrich and uh, all familiar to you, but that the idea that architecture is more than making something beautiful, uh, the idea that architecture can have meaning beyond beauty is for me uh, a fascinating idea. I mean, it means that you can empower people, you can you can create added value. And the easiest way to do that is on the ecological side, because that we can measure like I did with that Haka project. But when you can start to do that on the social side and use architecture as a way to also to create social equality or uh, inclusiveness or new financial models through architecture and the way in which you, you organize urban space, then I think you really make an impact as an architect. But that's my personal opinion. And I think for me, the measure for me is in every project, we try to, to achieve some of these goals and we, um, we never manage to achieve what we want, but we, we aim for 200% and if we achieve 70%, then already it's better than uh, than what we would have done if we had aimed, you know, for less. So I think I think that the greenwashing is I can I can relate to that question uh, absolutely. And what was the the second part of the question? Because I've gone on a tangent. No, well, it was uh, similarly related. It was about how uh, performance materials uh, like performance glass are now substituting oh, yeah. uh, for for passive yeah. architectural ideas. Yeah, I think this is a. I mean, this is actually disgraceful because if you if you look at uh, intelligent design, if you look at nature, 
um, the, the first step in nature, and actually that's our first principle as designers, we always say we first want to go low tech or no, no tech, then low tech, and then high tech. And that's actually the step that we always do in, in our design process. And we see that, um, that actually from the 70s when there was a lot of fossil fuels, uh, we in Holland, in Europe in any case, we gave away our power as architects and, and uh, we started relying on engineers to organize our indoor comfort. So basically an engineer just says, 21 degrees all year round, I'll organize it with installations. And then you get the glass and the, all the layers, et cetera, what you're talking about. And I think, uh, I think uh, intelligent design uh, means you have to start thinking about what can you do without the installations, make a building that makes sense, and then obviously add those layers. And the problem is that the, insta the guys who do the installations, they earn money based on the amount of installations they put in the building. The more installations they put in the building, the better they get paid. So there has to be a change in model. Uh, the clients have to pay these guys more. The more, the less installations they put in the building, the more money they should get. Yeah. Because that, then you're lowering the operational costs. So there, it's a paradigm shift. Uh, but I think it's something that we're slowly coming out, out of and it's up to us as architects to, to make a stand as far as that's concerned. Okay, brilliant. Uh, I'm just going to go through the comments and uh, just then, I mean, uh, students are, well, students and uh, professionals in, in the room are very uh, are high in praise, brilliant work, fabulous, inspiring. <laughs> it's the stream that's coming here, so thank you. But I do want to ask a, a kind of hard question then based on what you just said now, uh, and it comes from a noobs one about sewage and understand the, 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 the sort of um, uh, process you went through with, with, with the wind wheel, uh, uh, which, which is all about creating something iconic in order to create momentum and to make a project happen from nothing, from ether, basically, right? Uh, and so there were certain kind of notions of iconic or tourism that, that, that was so uh, uh, important. But what seems to be more interesting is the pod that was developed. Uh, and the idea of adaptability and reuse, and that the form really may be more about attracting attention than being actually uh, suitable to efficient sewage or efficient uh, service uh, movements or even lifestyle, you know, how people want to live. Uh, uh, so, so, so just a question about that form, and, and do you think maybe that the project will also uh, shift in form towards the kind of innovations that have been thought in, in, yeah. in minutiae. I think I think so. I think it's uh, well. What's interesting is we have uh, we have the wind wheel concept, and we also have an innovation platform that we developed. So that little pod that we built that was with 33 partners, and all of those partners use that pod as a showcase for their innovations. But also by building it, new partnerships emerged, and those partners are doing real projects in the world with their innovations. So the wind wheel is also an accelerator for innovation. It's, it's using this as a vehicle to accelerate uh, innovation. And uh, the project in, in, in America, uh, there's no housing in it. So that's gonna be a fully commercial uh, uh, project. Um, and so I think the form of that structure, uh, probably it will stay pretty much as it is, but we've also got this more vertical structure, which accommodate, actually it's just two towers which are joined at the top so we can harvest this wind. We could also not join that th them at the top, to be honest, and still harvest the wind, but then we don't have the tourist attraction. And for me, the complexity, the interesting thing about the wind wheel is the layered business case, because basically our clients in, in, in America, they had, they had a plan. They, had, they were planning to build uh, like a London Eye. So they had the land, they had the plan, and next to that, on the ground, they wanted to build a convention center. And what they did was they saw our plan and they went to CBRE and that's, you know, the, these real estate experts, they do real estate of the whole world. And they showed them our plan and they showed them their plan and they said, well, what should we do? And CBRC said, you're crazy if you don't do the wind wheel because you're, there's a tourist attraction that you can build for 15% of the cost. And it's going to have the same revenue. And you've got um, um, uh, you've suddenly got this whole uh, 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 this whole convention center in this iconic structure. So 
it becomes a kind of a win-win-win. And obviously the added complexity makes it very difficult. But I mean, we're working with Alf Arup on this project. It's the best engineer in the world. So if they can't do it, well, then uh, no one can. <laughs> Okay, brilliant. Do, does then I'm going to ask Namdi, Namdi Ella, who is the head of school, to, to ask the final question. Uh, Namdi, uh, do you want to come on, please? Um, good afternoon, Duzan. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Nabil, uh, Kirsten, and uh, Ms. Teron. Um, good afternoon, uh, students and uh, partners in the practice. We appreciate your joining us. I'll make my question quick. Um, thank you for the original presentation, and it's an original work, uh, highly innovation. My question would be, um, considering that in history we demonized modernism a great deal. Uh, for example, the plug-in city uh, by Peter Cook et al. Uh, Le Corbusier's work, Kenzo Tange's uh, metabolic architecture, and yet the technology was not there. And here you are doing it like a plug-in city um, uh, and uh, uh, your work is original. So where would you say that history has benefited us considering the technologies, the uh, sophistication of the different pieces, windmill and all the other items that you need to put in it? I'd like to stop there. Oh, that's a complex, <laughs> a complex question uh, to finish off with. I think um, I think it's a good point, and I think it's a, it's an interesting question in the sense that if you look at the the zeitgeist that we're in now, I think there's been an incredible acceleration in the in the last twenty or thirty years in terms of technology and innovation, and that's obviously driven by internet and access to information. So I think the digitalization of the world has accelerated uh, the, the innovation around the world. And I think that we've reached a point where uh, we can access the innovations from anywhere. I mean, obviously, globalization has, has, has reached a, a point where we can actually combine the best of the best. And uh, I, think, uh, I think the idea of, of um, creating an autonomous standalone structure is, um, is, is not a good idea. So uh, I explained the windmill as, as, as a basic autonomous structure, but actually the way in which we see it, and it's part of the thing I didn't explain, it's an urban, it's a renewable urban power plant. So it has an underground energy storage and it's actually supplying energy to the buildings around it. So it's part of a network and it's part of its surroundings. And the way in which we're using this building uh, in, in district development is actually as a, catal a catalyst for urban development because it's because of its iconic nature uh, and because of the, the the tourism aspect to it it's it's a strong enough uh, catalyst for as an urban generator so it's a very complex question uh, you you've posed and i think that's something we could spend a whole evening uh, talking about at the dinner table which i would love to do uh, but in the short time that we have i think uh, i i think what we're doing as architects is we see the potential of the modernists, how the modernists incorporated bioclimatic design into their idiom. And uh, we think that this bioclimatic approach to architecture, uh, but incorporating the potentials of innovation and new technologies can go hand in hand to, to create cities that, uh, that can sustain uh, uh, themselves in the future, because we really need to, as architects, create buildings and cities that uh, generate a lot more energy and utilize the, the flows, the streams, the material flows, the water in a much more cyclic uh, manner. And in that sense, we really do need a synergy between smart, low-tech uh, design, uh, which has stood the test of time, and the, the innovation that makes uh, some of these systems uh, feasible. Wow, okay. Uh, that they are Thank you very yes. much. Thank you very much. The, I Thank think you. we're... Hopefully, some things will clear and uh, we'll take you up on that uh, coffee or dinner or lunch date. Thank you. Thank you, Tuzan. Thank you. That's That's been really uh, uh, an inspirational lecture. Um, I think uh, the students can take a lot from that. Uh, I think mainly uh, this uh, agency that you've taken uh and, and and shifting what the practice is so 
uh, really thank you for sharing. Thank you for your time. And, and great to connect with you, you know, uh, across borders uh, and after so many years. So uh, thank you very much. And I hope we, we get to, to do that dinner with Nambi soon. Uh, thank yeah. you all our participants. Uh, thank you for joining us and join us in uh, two weeks uh, for the final lecture in the series. Thank you very much for having me. It was my pleasure. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Bye-bye.